Hi, I'm Matt Godbolt and I would like to talk to you about my Sega Master System emulator. This is the first emulator I wrote in JavaScript. I also have a BBC Micro emulator which is a lot more advanced and there's already a talk about that. But I'd like to talk today about this Master System emulator. So first of all, why would you emulate a Master System? Some of you may not even know what a Sega Master System is. It was an 8-bit console back in the 80s, made by Sega and had many of their popular games. But the real reason I chose to emulate the Sega Master System is that it was, it was my first console. And I remember vividly um, going uh, to France on the ferry, and on the ferry there was a an Altered Beast coin-op. And I played it with my sister and we had a great time and I thought it looked amazing. And I saw the graphics and I thought, I'd love to do this at home. I'd love to play this game at home. And I saw that there was a Sega Master System version and uh, I saved up some pennies and uh, eventually was able to buy a Sega Master System. I unwrapped it and we put Altered Beast in and we played it. And unfortunately, back in those days, the graphics weren't the same as the ones we saw in the coin-up. So we were a little bit disappointed, but nonetheless, it was my first console and I love it very much. And my favorite ever game is actually on this uh, console. I loved it so much, in fact, that uh, with my good friend Richard, or rather Richard sort of started it and then I picked it up with him towards the end, um, we wrote a Sega Master System emulator so we could play our favorite Sega Master System games for the Risk PC or the uh, Archimedes. And uh, here is a screenshot of me about to run uh, Miracle, which was the name of our uh, emulator for the Sega Master System. I did try to get um, my Risk PC emulator good, up to scratch enough to be able to run the Sega Master System emulator we wrote on it, but I was unable to. But you'll have to tr trust me that uh, we were actually able to play and run Sega Master System games on our Acorn Archimedes and Risk PCs in the mid to late 90s. Um, this was, of course, the first version of my of, of the emulator, and uh, I, I owe a huge amount of debt of thanks to uh, Richard Tobel Watkins and uh, the other people were, that we found along the way to to help us understand how a Sega Master System works. So, what's inside one of these things? Inside is an 8-bit Z80 CPU. Uh, it has eight kilobytes of RAM, which is not very much at all by today's standards. It has a custom video processor, the VDP, the video display processor. On that processor, there was a 16K of RAM that was uh, just accessible by that processor, directly at least. Uh, it generated a 256 by 192 64 color output, which is absolutely minuscule by today's standards, although it was scaled up obviously to fill the whole screen. It had a fairly standard SN76489 sound chip and the way that you plugged your games in was to slot in these uh, cartridges. So here you can see this double dragon on the right hand side. That is one of the uh, ROM cartridges that you would plug into the top. There was also a little port on the front where smaller ROMs could be just slid in like credit card sized. And that Teddy Boy Sega card image there shows you what one of those looked like. Those ROMs would have anywhere between 32 to 256 kilobytes of ROM. So an 8-bit machine um, typically has a 16-bit address space. Uh, 8 bits would obviously not be quite enough to, 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 to write anything meaningful with. Um, so the Z80 or Z80 um, sees 16K, sorry, 64K of uh, address space at any one time. And it's broadly broken down into four slices. Starting from the top, we have um, the 8K of onboard RAM. Let me get my, see if I can get my mouse pointer to work. Yes, so the very first top slice here between C000 and the top of RAM, the top of the address base, is uh, eight kilobytes of the onboard RAM split up twice. There's a mirror at the top, so you actually get to see the same 8K twice, which is just a weird uh, oddity. They just didn't wire the top pin in, presumably, to the RAM controller, um, or they were thinking of supporting 16K to start with and, and then didn't towards the end. There is something magical about the very top four addresses, but we'll talk about those in a second. But essentially, this is two banks of identical 8K RAM. And sorry, mirrors, I should say. There is exactly only 8K of RAM. You just see it twice. Then between 8,000 and C1,000 hex, 
there is um, some uh, page of uh, the ROM that has been slotted in. If you recall that the ROMs could be as big as 256K or even perhaps even bigger, the way that you would be able to access different aspects of the RAM, uh, the ROM would be to program in which slice of ROM appeared at this location. And so you could change that here. You could page in and out the ROM or indeed RAM at that location. Some of the cartridges would have their own RAM on them as well. Some of the more um, uh, things like Fantasy Star, which had a lot more um, stuff going on, required a bit more RAM too. And so they placed some RAM on the cartridge and were able to access the RAM there. Then uh, between 4,000 and 8,000, there's another page of ROM. And then between 0 and 4,000, yet another page. So we have these three selectable pages of ROM. We can pick three 16K slices of the ROM and um, pick and choose which ones we want. This gives us sort of 48K of ROM that we can see at any one time. Let's talk a little bit about this blue section at the bottom. Between 0 and 400 in hex, there is one kilobyte of ROM that always comes from the, the zeroth bank of ROM. It's always bank zero. And that's because the processor requires um, the things like the interrupt handlers, the reset handlers, NMI handlers to all live at this particular address. And for convenience sake, that meant that you could place them in the bank zero of your um, of your application or of your, your game. And then it doesn't matter which ROM page you selected for the remainder of uh, that zeroth bank at the bottom between zero and 4,000, you know that the interrupt handler and the NMI handler would always come from bank zero. You wouldn't have to duplicate that between all of your pages of, uh, of ROM that you would like to play page in. If, um, if that wasn't the case, you would have to put interrupt handling code at any bank of ROM that you'd like to page in at this bottom block here, which would be very inconvenient. So how do we page these things? Now we're gonna go up to this area up here. We have these four magic addresses that if you write to, change what the memory layout looks like. So if you write a byte to FFFF, then you're selecting what the second page um, will be. And I've put RAM here, but it's RAM or ROM here. Likewise, FFFE and FFFD select uh, the zero, one, or two, these three blocks here. They choose which slice of the ROM appears there. And then in FFFC, you can configure whether or not the cartridge RAM or ROM appears uh, at that um, that bottom, sorry, this between 8,000 and C1000 here. Um, again, that was only supported for some um, ROMs that had RAM on them, which is confusing. So I should say one of the cartridges that had both RAM and ROM in it. So if we're gonna write a function in JavaScript to pretend to be the memory system of a Sega Master System, we might write something that looks like this. We're gonna read a byte from a particular address and we'll get to how we understand what the address is and how when this is called in a minute. Um, effectively, we're just writing a bunch of if statements. Um, if the address is less than that 400 hex, then we know that that's the very special thing that always reads from ROM bank zero. So we can have an array, whoops, excuse me. We can have array at um, of, of uh, banks of ROM and the zeroth one will always be accessed when we access um, hex 400. Otherwise, if it's less than 4,000, then we know that we're just going to look up the page register and get the zeroth page register out. That will tell us which ROM bank is currently mapped at the bottom um, uh, ROM slot. We'll access that particular ROM bank and then we'll say, well, let's get the byte from within that selected ROM bank. If it's less than 8,000, then we're gonna do the same, but we're gonna do page one. And of course now the index into that page is, is gonna be 4,000 less than, than uh, the address that we're given in. Otherwise we'll be reading off the end of the first one and, and so on. And then if we look at these other um, pages here, um, you can see that um, there's some more complexity if we're gonna look at the, um, the 8,000 to C1000 um, block. There's some handling of whether it's ROM or RAM, which I've not put on here. Uh, otherwise, it's, we know we've hit the RAM, and if we've hit the RAM, we're just going to look at the uh, the, the RAM um, block um, given by the offset from the beginning of RAM. And again, then uh, if we've fallen off the end of that part, there we know that we're at the duplicate of RAM. 
So we're going to see the same 8K again, and this last line here covers that case where we're reading from E000 onwards, and um, we see the same RAM that we would have seen earlier, just repeated. So that's pretty straightforward, and you can see perhaps the how we're going to start to put this together to make an emulator. Let's talk a little bit about the Z80 itself. Uh, I've got into the habit of saying Z80, I should say Z80, obviously natively I'd say Z80, but at work I've given up arguing about whether it's pronounced Z or Z, and um, and so it's going to be Z80, Z80, whatever. So the Z80 itself, so this is the processor that's powering the whole show. It is a CISC chip, I don't think anyone could argue with that. It has 900 or more instructions with no multiply or divide. Interestingly, it has a separate input-output bus. Many of its contemporaries that I'm, I'm much more familiar with, for example the 6502, uh, did not have a separate input-output system. In fact, they relied on magic memory areas to configure um, and talk to peripherals, but the Z80 wanted to have a separate channel for talking to those devices. So um, there are in specialized instructions to input and output bytes onto like an I.O. bus. That's how we talk to the sound chip, that's how we talk to the display chip um, and some of the other peripherals on the system. It ran around about 3.53 megahertz. Uh, it depended on whether or not you were in PAL or NTSC regions and um, the specifics of that are beyond my comprehension f fully, but um, I think it was to do with saving the number of oscillators that they needed to actually have on the boards. Um, it was not pipelined and the minimum number of cycles it would take to execute a single instruction would be four. So four cycles to, to do even the simplest thing, like a knob even. Um, so that's about a microsecond. So it's pretty pretty slow. Um, for a load or an add, you're talking more like seven cycles. So again, the, the, the throughput is not very, very, not very big, not very high, I should say. Um, but it had an awful lot of cool features, which we'll get to on the other side here. So we have many registers. Whereas its contemporary, the 6502, had three registers, uh, charitably four if you, can, if you uh, uh, consider the stack pointer to be a register, the Z80 has 18 of them. And it has A through E, and then H and L. And then these sort of secondary um, A prime, B prime registers, which weren't directly accessible, but could be switched in and out for their namesakes. And indeed, the entire set of registers could be switched backwards and forwards, which is quite convenient. Obviously, it has flag registers for comparisons. It has interrupt handlers. It has the R register, which for the longest time I thought was a random number generator, but actually is the refresh for the dynamic RAM. Um, register. It tells the RAM system which bank of dynamic RAM is going to be refreshed next. And so although if you were to sample it at sort of irregular intervals, you would effectively get a random number, uh, it was also possible to write to this register, which means you could actually completely break the dynamic RAM by, for example, sitting in a tight loop storing zero to the R register. But let's not worry about that right now. That's not very important. But it's just interesting to note that this was available to the programmer. These registers were also pairable to do 16-bit operations. And this is where the Z80 really shines. The AF um, registers were not particularly useful. This was the uh, accumulator and the flags register, but you could push and pop it. But once you started looking at BC, DE, and HL, you have actually useful 16-bit operations that you can do. You could add HL to DE, and you could read using HL as like a um, uh, an index register so th this kind of took the place of the the zero page of a 6502 there are also four 16 bit registers that is explicitly 16 bit registers some index registers called ix and iy and then the stack pointer and the program counter were full 16 bit registers too so let's have a look at what some uh, z80 code might look like here is just some fairly random um, opcodes here um, on the far left hand side is the address that we're disassembling. The second column in blue, I forget I've got a mouse pointer, I can point at these things. Uh, these bits, these here, the 212A06, for example, that is the instruction encoding of the instruction we're seeing on the right hand side here. So this is a load instruction, a load HL. So this loads the register pair HL with 2A06, except that. Because this is a little Endian computer, the 
number actually loaded is 062A. This tells us, in fact, where this is where the HL register gets its name from. The H is the high part and the L is the low part. So we're loading the high part and then the low part separately. Although that's not actually true, is it? Because that's 062A over there. So, so scratch that. I've obviously got that wrong. I thought that was the order that they were stored in memory, but perhaps the instruction encoding is different. Uh, <laughs> just goes to show, I don't know. Anyway, we can see that there's a, a, a an operation here that's loading HL with 2A06 or 062A. Um, the next uh, instruction here is an add, and this is an add A with A instruction. So that's a single byte and effectively doubles the A register, the accumulator. So, so that's an 8-bit register being doubled. It's the same as shifting it up by one. That would still take four cycles, even though it's a single byte here. Some transfers and other bits and pieces going on here. Um, here's a 16-bit add, for example, the 590, uh, 591 address. This 19 over here is the encoding for add HL with DE. So it's a pretty compact representation of the instructions. And in fact, all of these remaining instructions here are a single byte, even though some of them are pretty complicated. Um, and I used to know what this piece of this routine was actually doing, but for the life of me, I can't recall now. So um, we'll just have to gloss it over. I've put some comments on the right hand side here as to what each one is doing. And you can see that um, there's some very clever things going on. And I can't even remember. I think it's some kind of index table lookup now. Now I think about it. Anyway, it's not really important right now. You can just see that there is a correspondence between the sequence of bytes in memory and how they're interpreted as instructions. And this is how we're going to build up our emulator of the processor itself. So how do we decode that sequence of bytes? Well, the Z80 has an optional prefix, which I don't think was shown on the previous slide. No, there are no prefixes in this. That's not very useful. Um, these pre prefix bytes here change the meaning of the following instruction. So um, we've got some examples down the bottom, but so we've got this optional prefix followed by a byte that explains what the opcode is doing. And then depending on what that opcode is, there's either zero, one or two following bytes that encode the operand. So here are some examples. The exclusive ORing A with A, which is a very common way of setting A to zero, is a single byte instruction of AF. That is, of course, less bytes than the equivalent um, which of loading A with zero. And we can see what that would look like by looking at the next line. So this is loading A with the immediate value FF, 255. This would be 3EFF. So if we wanted to load A with zero using load A, it would be 3E00, and it would take two bytes to encode that instruction. Instead, we can exclusive or it with itself, and it only takes one byte AF. Down here, we're loading B with the context of, of an index register plus 15. This is one of those examples where the there is a prefix byte. This prefix byte DD says, in the following instruction, any references to HL should be interpreted as being IX. So if we were to just look at 460F, that would be load B with HL plus OF. But instead, this DD means use the index register in place of HL. So DD460F is load B with the index, the, the memory address pointed to by the index register plus 15. That's kind of a powerful thing to be able to do in a single instruction. And you can see that this OF here corresponds to the constant offset that's been placed um, in the instruction. And then finally, this uh, ED opcode over here um, for the life of me, I can't recall quite why this is uh, needs a, an extension, um, but obviously it shifts the instruction in some way from some other point. Uh, apologies for not being able to remember it off the cuff. I thought I remembered all of these things, but clearly not. It's been a while. So what would our JavaScript look like? Well, the main loop would say, fetch the byte that's currently pointed to by the Z80's program counter. And we might as well automatically increment that too. That's this z80.pc++. And our read byte function is the function we've already seen, the one before with all of the cascading ifs to determine what um, what actual piece of either ROM or RAM we should read from. And then we have a huge switch statement. And for every single opcode, we just write the implementation. So for example, that AF, if you recall, was an exclusive or A with A. So let's do it. Let's do z80.a exclusive or z80.a, assuming that this z80 structure has 
all of the registers sort of written out inside of it. And then we're done. We've already incremented the program counter. We're going to break out of this and presumably we're going to stay in a loop um, executing uh, more instructions until we reach some terminating condition. Uh, here is an example, for example, of um, an instruction that needs a constant that's in stream. So that 3e, if you remember, that was the load a with an immediate value. So here instead, we're just going to do read a uh, by reading the next byte um, pointed to by the program counter. So that will read the constant value that was after the 3e. So if you recall, we, we saw 3eff before to mean make a equal to ff. We would read the 3e, come down here. We would notice that we need to do another byte read. We'd increment the program counter again to read the and read the byte, and then we'd set that in a. So there's 900 instructions, and there's the shifts to worry about as well. But effectively, you just sort of plug your headphones on and you start plugging away at all of these. But it's really not quite that easy. We're missing out a few things here. When we load values into registers, a whole bunch of other things happen too. For example, there are a number of flags. Flags like the value you loaded was zero, or um, if you add values together, did it overflow? Did it carry? The Z80 has this notion of parity and half carries, where for things like binary coded decimal, um, if there was a carry from bit three to bit four, then the flag would be set telling you that that had happened. The parity flag was um, always set to say whether or not the current byte was either even or odd. And of course, then there's a sign bit that says the value that you loaded in was negative. So there's a lot of things going on there. So I, if we go back a slide and we look at this exclusive OR that we're doing over here with the A exclusive OR Z80.A, um, we'd have to set the zero flag because now the, zero, the A register is zero. We'd have to clear the negative flag. We'd have to clear the carry flag and a bunch of other things like that. So it's not quite as simple as we've written out here. We also have to handle things like interrupts. If we were to just sit in a tight loop executing uh, instruction after instruction after instruction, there would be no way for the, the, the simulation to, to end. I mean, you could do tens of thousands of them and then whatever, but we also know that some of the peripherals that are on the system are capable of generating interrupts. For example, the video blank signal. So when the beginning of a video frame happens, then the video chip generates an interrupt to say, hey, it's the start of a new frame. The Z80's interrupt pin goes low and it's up to the CPU to stop executing where it is and to head off to some other part of memory by reading from that low um, area of, of memory, if you remember, the one that always comes from ROM bank zero. <clears throat> so we need to handle those in some way. There are also undocumented opcodes. Not all of the 256 possible instructions or the however many more, 1,024 if you include the four prefix bytes, had documented meanings, but they did things. Um, the 6502 um, has um, a, a simpler design and its undocumented opcodes op are very well understood. I'm not really sure what the Z80 does in, when undocumented opcodes come along. So, I mean, I don't think many, or if any, of the commercially available games used anything that was undocumented, but it's something you need to think about. So in summary, it was really complicated. It's complex to emulate a Z80. And so when I was writing this project, I borrowed a, an existing Z80 implementation from a JavaScript version of a Spectrum emulator, which itself was based on a, a C implementation of a, a Z80 processor. So big thanks to the JS Speccy people for making their code open source. So the result of adding a if we were to look at the add a comma some kind of uh, constant instruction, this is what actually gets generated. It's an awful lot more than our naive um, implementation that I showed you a moment ago. Some of these things are constant tables that are just set up once. But if we start from this uh, var c equals read byte here, this is us reading the value that we're going to write, uh, sorry, the value that we are going to add onto the accumulator we calculate the result. So this is just a simple add. And now we need to do something very complicated, looking at the overflow bits from before, looking at the overflow bits afterwards, um, both the top bit and the half uh, bit. 
and we generate together whether the top bits are set and we kind of come up with a table index which looks into this uh, SZ uh, and HC and overflow tables each of which has something which tells us what's going to happen um, to the carry, to the half carry, to the overflow and then finally we look up the actual value, the final value um, based on its um, result. So this this sets the sign and the zero and some of the bits that aren't defined inside the um, flags register. So obviously in the um, over the sorry the SZ53, which is the sign and zero table, half of those values with the, all of them with the top bit set will have the sign bit set. Um, the value that's exactly zero will have the zero bit set and so on. So that allows us to kind of reasonably quickly assemble the, all these complicated flags in one go. So we worked out what the new value of the A register was as a result of the add, and then we resulted worked out what the resultant flags would be. And then we took seven cycles. It's important for us to know how long that instruction took so that we can account for time later on, which with interrupts and uh, uh, other things is very important. So there were about 900 different instructions, as we said before. We already have a table of what opcodes to like a human readable form. For example, zero is a NOP, one here is load BC with NNNN, which means a 16 byte, a 16 bit constant, a two byte constant. O2 is load BC, comma A. And the clever thing that both Specky and JS Specky do is that they pre process this big table of values of ASCII effectively into JavaScript. And that avoids an awful lot of repetitive code. So again, there's this 900 odd instructions. There's like a, a thousand lines of Perl that generates 5,400 lines of JavaScript. So it will like look at, for example, LDBC comma. It knows that the case one will be set BC to NNNN. And from that, it infers that it needs to read two more bytes and then it places it in BC. So you write the, the generator code once run it on this big big test set of opcode tables, this sort of disassembly table, and Bob's your uncle, you end up with a huge amount of automatically written JavaScript, which is a lot easier than writing it all by hand and a lot less error prone. If you can imagine there's gonna be a load BC comma A, there's gonna be a load DE comma A, there's gonna be a load HL comma A, and they're all gonna be scattered through the table. And having written it once and tested it for BC, it's going to work for DE, it's going to work for HL. So that's what I'm going to talk about for for execution. Let's talk about something that's a lot prettier, the video display. So here we can see a beautiful um, output of oh I can't even think what I can't think what it's called now Fantasy Zone. Hugely very colourful, lots of sprites on the screen, a lot going on, almost impossible to see what you would crash into and what would shoot at you and <laughs> whatever. But that's that's not neither here nor there. So let's talk about the VDP. As I said before, it has 16K of RAM just to itself. This RAM is on the VDP chip and is not part of the memory space of the Z80. The Z80 can't see that memory directly. It's only accessible by using the input and output root, uh, pins and the input and output instructions that the Z80 has. That 16K of RAM contains a whole bunch of sort of sprite tiles and some pallets and then tables that tell it how to assemble those tiles to make both the background and the foreground sprites. It also has an interrupt generator which will generate interrupts um, at the top of screen and at uh, various places down the screen if, as, if programmed. So what are tiles? Tiles are these 8 by 8 4 bit per pixel pictures that have one of two palettes. This is just a dump of one of the games. I, I can't even remember what it is. Oh, I think this is Wonder Boy 3. Yeah, I think this is Wonder Boy 3. Um, it has um, a lot of data all over it. I think down here, this sort of bit here, which I always thought this looks like ET. This is what happens if you count upwards and you sort of interpret it as colors and pixels. Um, I think this is probably the sprite table in the middle of it all. And then the rest of it is just sp sprite data itself. Um, the tiles are so-called planar mapped. So each pixel can have um, one of uh, 16 values, it's four bit per pixel. And so for example, we might have the pixel values here, there are eight pixels here, eight, zero, 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 15. 
and naively you might imagine storing them as 8000015 or at the very least combining this 4-bit value with the next 4-bit value to make one byte here between the 8 and the 0 and then another byte here and then another byte here and then finally another byte here of 0 and then 15 or 0f in hex but just because hardware is funny um, it turns out to be easier for the hardware if um, these are stored with the bits separated out so we have four bytes in a row same amount of storage this first eight value here needs to be represented in byte zero as the zero uh, zero byte two is zero zero byte three is zero and then byte four is one so this is the binary representation of eight one two four eight but separated across four consecutive bytes similarly the zero here is zeros and so are all the other ones and then finally this 15 here is separated again across four consecutive bytes as one 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 in the zero bit position of four consecutive bytes each tile is eight by eight which means that we have eight lots of four bytes which is 32 bytes for each tile the background itself is made out of a 32 by 24 arrangement of those tiles so if you think about the, each of those tiles is like a mosaic piece we can pick them up and choose them as we see fit in a 32 by 24 array and that's what the video display unit will show as the background each tile in that background has two bytes we can have up to 512 um, tiles to choose from so um, we need nine bits to select which tile we would like to show at this particular location the hardware supports flipping the tile in both the vertical and the horizontal direction so we have two bits to control that so we can have it vertically flipped horizontally flipped both or neither we can pick one of two palettes so one bit says either the base palette or the sprite palette there's one bit that determines whether or not this background tile shows in front of sprites or whether it's behind the sprites so typically as a background you would have it behind but if you want to have like columns that your main character can walk behind you would set that bit to say this tile shows in front of the um of, of all the sprites and then there are three user bits which is kind of they were uninterpreted by the hardware they were used sometimes by games to store extra metadata about the tiles that you landed on but ultimately they were just because there was no other way there's nothing else to do with these bits they were just left over so that's the background so here is Wonderboy 3 in all of its beautiful glory and um, you can see that this is I, I've removed all of the sprites we're just looking now at the background tile so the background in this instance will also contain the top two rows here which contain the status row including the one heart I've got the one potion I've got and the four gold I've managed to collect so far so those are all part of the background here is the first few lines of just the sprite number the tile number table um, I've highlighted areas that are interesting so here this 2o and this 2o here is hex 32 that's just that's the, that's a blank that's actually off the edge of the screen you can't see that but here the 0212 and the 0313 encode for the tiles the four 8 by 8 tiles that make up the top left of the heart the top right of the heart the bottom left of the heart and the bottom right of the heart these hex 202020 appear to be these gray blank tiles and then we get over to the potion bottle here and this potion bottle corresponds to this 0616 0717 again of the top left top right bottom left and bottom right of the potion now there's no number above so there's a little blank space here so that's also the hex 20 which coincidentally is a space in ascii and then if we look at the 01 underneath we see 3031 which is in decimal 48 and 49 which is actually the ascii codes of 0 and 1 it seems like the programmers chose just to make things convenient to place the text um, glyphs in the location corresponding to their ascii code there's no need for them to have been done that way but that is how it's been done and indeed we see that pattern repeating up here with the gold of gold and the number 4 here so that's kind of interesting and in fact if we go back to the sprite table here this is the 48 49 50 table and you can see like the a b c d e g it looks like they've used um these are the only characters that are needed 
in the game and they've left them in the right place although oh, that seems that the pause is not in the right spot at all how interesting well anyway we'll, we'll stop like picking apart a 25 year old game um, and we'll carry on looking and the last thing here is just looking at how these clouds are put together I haven't got enough room to show the whole screen but you can see that the, the cloud is made out of a lot of tiles 6a 7a or this kind of thing here which is repeated in these three different locations to give us three different cloud areas here so that's an example of the background Let's talk about the sprites. That's where the interesting stuff happens. The hardware supports 64 sprites, which can be either 8x8 8 8 pixels or 8x16 8 pixels. There's a 256-byte table that explains where the sprites should go, and it sets their X and Y and their tile index. So for each sprite, I can independently move a little 8x8 8 -8 slice of a uh, tile, and I can place it anywhere on the screen I like. It can only be one of the first 256 tiles because we've only got one byte to store the tile index and there's no space to store palette index 2. So all of the sprites, sorry, there's no space to store something to allow me to choose the palette. So all of the sprites use the second palette. Um, there's actually a 64 byte hole in the sprite table here that's not that's unused. Presumably at some point the hardware designers thought that they were going to use X, Y, tile index and maybe some attributes, but they never did. So that fourth byte of the, uh, of the 64 sprites in the 256 byte table is spare. And I've noticed some games packing extra tiles in that area as the sprite type table is essentially in the middle of the tile RAM. So here is that same scene we were looking at before, except that now we can see Wonder Boy and some gold coins above him and one of the little snake things that's about to attack him. Let's look at how that looks. Here is the sprite table and we've got the 64 from zero to 63 uh, entries in the sprite table. And you can see that we have X, Y, and then tile number. And what that corresponds to, for example, is that that first six set of tiles there corresponds to the six sprites that actually make up the, what we would think of as a sprite. You know, you think of Wonder Boy himself as being a sprite, but from a hardware perspective, perspective he's made up of six sprites all packed, put next to each other. So that's Wonder Boy. The next four here make up the uh, little snake dude. These two over here are the um, coin that's flipping around. And then this Y position, this magic Y position of 208 was a marker to say, stop rendering sprites. That's the last entry in the table. So whatever the hardware was doing is it started at the zeroth entry in the table and it ran through until it hit this Y position, which said there's nothing more. So even though you can see in 13 and 14, there is some valid data here. And then from 15 onwards, there's nothing. These are not looked at. These were presumably sprites that were on the screen earlier but have been since um, either come away or have been killed or whatever. Um, certainly there's no need to write zeros into there. So we just write a marker that says that's the end of the sprites right now. The sprites also supported some sort of collision detection. That is, they were transparent. Um, one of the colors, one of the 15 colors was, was the, one of the 16 colors, I'm sorry, um, was a transparent color that you could see through. Um, when two sprites tried to fight for the same pixel, if they were being drawn over each other, a bit was set that allowed um, sort of primitive collision detection. But it was it was very difficult to know which two sprites had collided. So I didn't ever see any games using it particularly. Um, but it was there if you wanted it. And then as part of the sort of general fetch of the, the screen, what, what I believe is happening is that the beginning of each horizontal line on the screen the hardware walks that whole sprite table and works out which sprites might be visible on that line. And uh, then it would um, pick the right slice of the each sprite at, to draw as it was going across. And that process, that intermediate process, only had uh, room to store eight active sprites. So if there were more than eight sprites on a single line, um, anything after the first eight would be dropped. And that's what's happened in this picture here. So this is a, that original picture of Altered Beast. We can see we've got two flappy wing back things coming down from the top. Um, the right hand one is fully drawn over here. Where's my mouse pointer there? Over here. But the left hand one, unfortunately, has overflowed the eight possible sprites. And so we only see a little bit of it. What games typically did at this point would be they would sort of cycle through the sprites so that they all had an equal um, opportunity of being in the first eight at any time. And so you would see the sort of flashing, flickering thing if there were two 
too many sprites on the same line. So not ideal, but uh, I guess a, a workaround, a decent enough workaround. We're going to very quickly talk about sound as I realize that I'm talking and time is ticking on. Um, the sound chip was, was a fairly standard um, chip used at the time. Um, it had a pretty simple four channel uh, output. Three of them were square waves and one was a noise channel. Each channel could be configured to have a volume and it had two bytes of frequency. So there was just a single register you would write to with these different bit patterns to sort of pick what um, whether you were changing the volume, the high or the low frequency of a particular channel. And so to make a, a, a an emulation of the sound, uh, effectively what we're doing is we, we count down the, the frequency that was set in, the, the value, the high and low bits that were set in here to, to pick the frequency, we used to initialize a counter and then depending on both the sample rate of the web browser that we're outputting to and the, the actual frequency that we're emulating the sound chip running at, we just tick that counter down. And then every time that counter goes below, below zero, we re restore it to its original value or add on the original value to sort of put it back up to um, start counting down again. And we toggle whether we're outputting a one or a zero. That gives us a square wave, wave with a, a, a period of this frequency that was selected. And then we sum up for all the channels um, where uh, either a one or a minus one, depending on when we're on, times the volume. And that just gives us an attenuated square wave running at the correct frequency. So there was also a noise channel. That noise channel is effectively a white noise, or ish. Um, if you look at um, how the, uh, the the noise functions worked, it was a linear feedback shift register, which is a poor man's random number generator. As you can see here, if you've ever written your own random number generator, it looks something like this, where you're sort of shifting bits around. So you, you start with a, a, a value, and then each time you call this, you shift things around, exclusive or it with itself, and um, then you return whether or not the bottom bit is set. And that gives us a one bit output that is gonna oscillate between zero and one. Now, this does have a period. It does actually repeat after a relatively short amount of time. So although it was a noise sounding, sort of a, a, a uh, white noise sounding thing it had some kind of um, period to it which was which could be exploited to make um, uh, other effects so we put it all together and we end up with um, this well, well this is a screenshot of Teddy Boy which was at one stage my favorite game um, on the Master System after the disappointment of uh, Altered Beast and hopefully if I have this still up what I have now over here is Wonder Boy 3 and in fact I've caught it not not through uh, design, but almost in exactly the same pose as it was before when I showed the uh, sprites. So here is um, the web page that I uh, have it running at. And um, one of the things, if you're writing an emulator, one of the things that's really, really worth investing time in is writing an integrated debugger. So over here we have uh, a full debugger going on and I can set breakpoints and I can single step and all that kind of stuff. But I am just going to continue playing this and you can see it's running the demo actually at the moment. And there is Wonder Boy running around doing his thing. Um, and uh, that's it really. I mean, there there it is running in, in, in JavaScript in a browser. It runs pretty well on phones nowadays. Uh, it's pretty impressive um, how fast browsers have gotten these days. So I'm gonna stop that again and go back to my presentation. Um, just a quick word on optimization. If you're interested in this kind of thing, I would recommend actually looking at my uh, BBC Micro talk. Um, the emulator for that is a lot more sophisticated. I've spent a lot more time on it and I've spent a lot more time looking at optimizing it and get it, making it go fast. Um, measure first is just a key thing. I have to say that I'm sort of almost contractually obliged to say measure first. Optimization is the, one of the most fun things to do. It's really challenging, it's interesting. Um, but it's only worth doing if you can show that it was necessary and that your optimization really did make things go faster. So measure first, measure second, measure afterwards. And then table lookups are the key. Um, anything that you can pre-compute, you put in a table. It, even today with um, processors being as fast as they are and RAM being as, as slow relatively, um, it was worth making tables for a lot of things. So certainly inside the video unit, there's a lot of tables. You saw how the Z80 processor has tables for all of its intermediate um, flag setting things. That was definitely a worthwhile thing to do. 
Uh, browsers nowadays um, support typed arrays and moving to uint8 arrays and uint32 arrays made a giant difference in the performance. Uh, using asm.js type constructs um, where you would um, like pipe with zero to just prove to the compiler, the JavaScript JIT compiler that is, that this value is never going to be anything funky. It's not going to be a nan, it's not going to be a string, it's going to be a number. That pipe zero, the result of that is defined to be an integer number. It's not a double or anything like that. That seems to help a little. Um, I don't know how true that is nowadays, but um, uh, it's so definitely worth going back and measuring that, I should say. Um, making things constant helped um, at least back when this talk was originally written. Nowadays, I think, again, the JITs are clever enough to notice that a value is not modified and can assume that it has not changed and then fall back if it does change later on. Um, but uh, obviously, the more hints you can give the, the JIT compiler, the better. So that's um, everything I've got to say right now about the master system and how you would emulate it and how you'd emulate it in JavaScript. Uh, my details are on there. Uh, the screen right now. I'll put them in the, the show notes, show notes, the <laughs> video notes. Um, it's open source, so go take a look at the source and have a laugh at it. Um, you can play it at the link there. The Zania org um, is a, a, a link to it. Oh, and thank you, YouTube. Um, there is a lot of information at smspower.org and um, Richard Tobel Watkins, my partner in crime in the original Miracle, or rather the progenitor of the original one, I should say, has written a lot of documentation there, which has helped a lot of people understand how to emulate a Sega Master System um, a lot better, including the guys from Lizard Cube, who have made the most amazing version of Wonder Boy 3. You must go out and buy it immediately. It's on Wii, it's on Steam, it's on um, uh, the the Nintendo Switch. It just, just go get it. It's wonderful. It's a beautiful version of it. It shows the original game off to its finest, and it also um, shows how you can take the original game and make it look absolutely beautiful by giving it a modern graphics and a, a, a live soundtrack. So do check that out at lizardcube.com. Um, if you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate to email me. If you've liked this video, please comment or like. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. I will be doing some more videos both um, on this, on other emulation, on other low-level stuff, and maybe some C++ stuff in the future. Thanks.